Now we'll finish chapter 13. We'll begin with the oceanic ridge system on page 419 in your book. So the, um, at the bottom of the ocean floor, where we have some divergent plate boundaries, the seafloor is going to be elevated. And basically these mid-ocean ridges are underwater mountain ranges. Um, sometimes they're called rises or mid-ocean ridges or just oceanic ridges. Um, we have been able to identify these ridge systems from all of the testing that we've done, all of those bathymetric calculations that we've done on the ocean floor. Um, also from taking core samples from deep sea drilling um, and also using submersibles where um, someone can get into a little submersible like Alvin pictured for you on page 419. And these uh, scientists can reach depths of about 15,000 feet in these submersibles. Oceanic ridges are characterized by extensive normal and strike slip faulting, earthquakes, high heat flow, and recent volcanism. And again, that's because they are along divergent plate boundaries. The interconnected ridge system is the longest topographic feature on Earth's surface. Um, if we take a look at the ridge system, we'll notice that it winds through all of the major oceans. There's a figure at the bottom of page 419 that shows this for you. Um, large sections have been named based on their locations within the ocean basins or along these. Um, continental uh, or these uh, oceanic continental boundaries, these divergent boundaries or the oceanic oceanic boundaries. Um, we have the mid-Atlantic Ridge and the mid-Indian Ridge. We also have the East Pacific Rise, which is on the East Pacific. It doesn't actually go right down the middle of the Pacific. It's in the Eastern uh, Pacific um, coming down from North America and kind of skirting uh, on the eastern side of South America. When we um, look at some of the segments of the oceanic ridge system, we see that some of them are actually down faulted structures that are called rift valleys. Um, and they have a little bit different structure and a little bit different um, topography than some of the other ocean ridges that we see. So here is um, this map that shows the distribution of the oceanic ridge system and they're color coded here by their spreading rates. Remember these are along divergent plate boundaries so they're going to be spreading and you see that the east pacific rise here um, is spreading fast um, comparatively fast, um, whereas um, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the Southwest Indian Ridge, and the Mid-Indian Ridge are um, spreading slow relatively. So now we'll um, take a look at these specific rift valleys with another smart figure video. Hey there, it's Callan Bentley. Welcome back for another smart figure. This time we're going to take a look at seafloor spreading and we're going to look a little bit more closely than we did in chapter number two. After watching the video, you should be able to describe how the difference in rates of seafloor spreading are manifested as different structures on the ocean floor. Okay, let's uh, review what we already know. We know that seafloor spreading takes place in the lithospheric gap between two separating tectonic plates. So this is what happens at a divergent plate boundary. And basically, new oceanic crust and underneath it, lithospheric mantle, are being generated in the wake of two plates that are moving apart from one another. So up here at the top, we've got one plate moving to the right, another plate moving to the left. And in between, we end up getting a little bit of partial melting, and that flows upwards, sealing shut fresh cracks in the oceanic crust, and therefore making new oceanic crust. 
This is where the ophiolite sequence comes from. This is, after all, a cross-section through the ocean floor. You can see deep sea sediments. Underneath those are pillow lavas. Below the pillow lavas are the, the bulk of the oceanic crust. We see the sheeted dike complex. Those are all those cracks that got filled in with lava and sealed shut. Below that is the intrusive version of the basalt, and that's gabbro. And some of the gabbro may be layered down at its base. And then underneath that is the mantle, peridotite, uh, that olivine-rich intrusive igneous rock. So that's the sort of rock sequence we would expect at a site of seafloor spreading. But the rates of seafloor spreading vary around the world. You can see here on this map that in the Atlantic, the rate of seafloor spreading is relatively slow, whereas the East Pacific rise has really rapid seafloor spreading. And then there are some other areas that are intermediate between those two. So this actually manifests itself in terms of a different shape to the oceanic ridge. If you have really fast seafloor spreading, you actually don't get a well-developed rift valley at the top of the oceanic ridge. Instead, you just get what's called a swell. So basically, it bulges upwards, but it's relatively smooth. Whereas if you have really slow seafloor spreading, like down here at the bottom, you get a very well-developed central rift valley. And that rift valley is marked by lots of normal faulting on either side. And the rate of seafloor spreading can be, you know, as much as uh, four times slower than the example up at the top. Intermediate rates of seafloor spreading have structures that are intermediate between the well-developed rift valley of slow seafloor spreading and the swell that shows up at sites of fast seafloor spreading. Okay, time for you to test yourself. What are we looking at here? The example at the top and the example at the bottom show two different rates of seafloor spreading. Which one is fast and which one is slow? Well, hopefully you said that because you see a very well-developed rift valley up here at the top, that must be a site of slow seafloor spreading, like the modern-day Atlantic Ocean. And because you've got a very well-developed swell here on the bottom, that would be a site where we have fast seafloor spreading, like the East Pacific Rise. Thanks so much for your attention. So now we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about the sediments on the seafloor. Remember in the previous video, we talked about those submarine canyons and the turbidity uh, currents that are essentially washing out these sediments onto the ocean floor. Um, so these turbidity currents are going to be responsible for a lot of this sediment, but other sediment is just going to be um, you know, kind of mixed in with ocean water and slowly settles to the seafloor. This is sometimes referred to as marine snow. The thickness of sediment is going to vary. It's the thickest in the trenches. You see their accumulations may approach um, 10 kilometers. When we look at the types of um, seafloor sediments, what we're going to see are three different types. Terrigenous, which means derived from land. Biogenous, and you know bio means life, so biogenous derived from organisms, so living organisms. And then hydrogenous derived from water. <clears throat> now we're going to look at each one of these separately, but kind of keep in mind that all sediment um, all sediments on the seafloor are mixtures. So we're going to have all different types of sediment, you know, just mixed together. No marine sediments come from just one source. So we're going to watch um, another smart figure video that walks us through the three types of sediments. And I will pause periodically to explain a little bit more. Hello, this is Callan Bentley. Welcome back for another smart figure. After watching this video, you should be able to distinguish hydrogenous sediments from the other sorts of sediments that form in the oceans, terrigenous and biogenous. So we've got three major categories of sediments that can accumulate in oceanic settings. This is an example of a terrigenous sediment. Basically what we have here is a beautiful graded bed, which starts at the bottom of the screen here and then goes up towards the top. Notice how it's made out of coarse grains of sand at the bottom, and then it gets finer and finer as it goes up. But all of these particles here are particles that come from the weathering of pre-existing rocks. And generally, those are being weathered off the land. So that's where the name comes from, terrigenous, generated by the land. Terrigenous sediments are in contrast to biogenous sediments. 
Biogenous sediments are defined as those sediments which are made out of particles from living things. So this could be something very dramatic like, uh, you know, fish bones or something like that. But more frequently, it's plankton. So we've got an image here showing some marine microfossils. And, uh, you know, if you made a rock out of these little skeletal remains, that would be an example of a biogenous sedimentary rock. What we want to talk about right now, though, are hydrogenous sediments. These are sediments that form directly due to chemical precipitation from the seawater. So you saw there the examples of terrigenous and biogenous, and they are greatly in contrast to this third um, category of hydrogenous. So terrigenous sediments, um, like he said, are going to consist of weathered rock, basically, that came from the land, was carried out into the ocean. So every area of the ocean is going to receive some part of terrigenous sediment. Um, the larger particles tend to settle, you know, rapidly near the shore. They're going to make up, you know, our continental shelf and continental slope. Um, but then some of the smaller particles can be carried thousands of kilometers away by ocean currents and then eventually settle down to um, the floor of the ocean. Um, the rate at which the sediment accumulates on the deep ocean floor is very slow. It can take as much as 10,000 years to form just a layer one centimeter thick. Now with biogenous sediment, you saw the image there of the um, marine microfossils. And their shells are hard, composed of silica or calcium carbonate. And um, when they die, their shells are basically just raining down um, to make up sediment on the ocean floor. Um, the most common type of biogenous sediment is calcareous ooze, which is calcium carbonate limestone. Um, it is produced from the tests or shells of organisms that inhabit warm surface waters. Um, as the shells begin to descend down into the ocean floor, um, they go through a, a layer of cool water and basically begin to dissolve and create this kind of ooze or mud. Another type of biogenous sediment that we have is um, silic silicus, and this is from um, things like diatoms, which contain um, tests or shells of silica, and also radiolaria. And we also um, get bones that also dissolve. And both of them kind of create this mud or ooze material. So now we'll look at the hydrogenous sediments. What you're looking at here in this image are manganese nodules. These manganese nodules are a common feature of the deep ocean. You can see that they're relatively round. And if you look at the cross-sectional view here, you can see that it's got layers to it. So almost like a a jawbreaker or maybe like a hailstone, something like that. Um, these things start around some little central nugget and then they get layer upon layer deposited on top of them. Another example are the metal sulfides that are deposited at deep sea black smokers. These black smokers are vents where basically really hot water comes spewing out into the deep ocean. This hot water has been passing through the hot lower portions of the oceanic crust where it's picked up a cocktail of dissolved elements. It spews that hot water with all that dissolved material out into the water, and it looks kind of like black smoke, but that's not really smoke. It's just basically very hot water with lots of stuff dissolved in it. And that ends up precipitating and building up these rock deposits that are a lot like chimneys um, where the material is flowing out into the seawater. They are, of course, the sites of these really extraordinary communities where all kinds of really weird creatures live, like these giant tube worms, entirely chemosynthetically based communities of organisms. So if we take a look at our package of sedimentary rocks, our uh, classification key, we've got some limestones up here at the top, and crystalline limestone, microcrystalline limestone, and travertine are all examples of hydrogenous sediments, sediments 
where calcite is directly precipitating from seawater. Now in the middle of our classification key, we've got things like coquina, fossiliferous limestone. Those are obviously made out of shell fragments. With fossiliferous limestone, they are usually whole shells, and with coquina, it's fragmentary, so they've been bashed to pieces. Chalk is also an example of a biochemical sedimentary rock uh, because chalk is made out of microscopic organisms, little coccolithophores, which are a kind of plankton. Down at the very bottom of this sedimentary rock classification chart, we can see that there are some other examples of hydrogenous sediments. We've got chert, which is silica that's directly precipitated from seawater, rock gypsum, which is gypsum directly precipitated from seawater, and good old rock salt, which is halite that's been precipitated directly from seawater. So you get the basic idea there. Hydrogenous sediments are precipitated directly from seawater, whereas biogenous involve life at some point, and terrigenous are the minerals and rock particles that are derived from the weathering of the crust up on the land. Thanks very much for your attention. So there you saw the three types of seafloor sediments. And so you're like, well, who cares? Why is that important? Well, the seafloor sediment provides us with climate data. You know, human climate records only go back a couple hundred years. Um, so how do we figure out what the climate was like prior to that time? Well, we know that we can drill through ice sheets and glaciers, and that tells us about um, the changing climate, but we can also get information from the seafloor. Changes in atmospheric and oceanic temperatures will be reflected in the nature of life in the sea. So since we have these biogenous sediments, um, if we can find their remains, then that will tell us some information about the climate. When the near surface organisms die, as their shells you know, slowly settle to the floor of the ocean and they become part of the sedimentary record, we can use that information because we know that the types of organisms that are on the ocean surface vary depending on what the temperature is and what the climate is like. So by studying those biogenous seafloor sediments, we can determine what the temperature was like in the ocean, but also in the atmosphere. So scientists are now really studying this data to give us information about previous climate changes. Now the last section of this chapter looks at resources from the seafloor. And so we know that we have quite a few resources that come from the C4 energy resources, um, more than 95% of the economic value from everything that we harvest from oceans comes from energy products. So this would include uh, oil and natural gas, as well as gas hydrates. Um, the ancient remains of microscopic organisms buried within those marine sediments before they completely decomposed are where we get the oil and natural gas. The percentage of the world's oil um, that is produced from offshore regions has increased um, from trace amounts in the 1930s to more than 30 percent today and this is due to continued technological advancements that are used by these offshore drilling platforms. So we have offshore reserves in the Persian Gulf, so around you know Saudi Arabia, um, Iran, Iraq area, in the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of Southern California, in the North Sea, and also in the East Indies. Um, our likelihood of finding new reserves of oil and natural gas on land is pretty small. So we're gonna be um, continuing to try to advance our technology to be able to tap into the resources on the seafloor. Of course, the environmental concern with that is the possibility of oil spills. Um, in 2010, we had one of the worst um, accidents we've ever had in offshore drilling, the Deepwater Horizon um, exploded. This was a uh, drilling platform um, and it um, caused a massive oil spill. The ocean was actually on fire for a time um, due to the oil and gas that were burning there. Um, so gas hydrates are 
very compact structures made of water and natural gas. And the most type, common type is methane. So we call these methane hydrates. They occur beneath permafrost um, on land and then at ocean depths at about 1700 feet. And basically with these gas hydrates, and there's a picture of these on page 425, uh, bacteria will break down the organic matter trapped in the sediments. So those biogenous um, sediments, and this produces methane gas. And they combine with water within these deep ocean sediments. And the gas essentially becomes trapped within the water molecules. Some estimates indicate as much as 20 quadrillion cubic meters of methane um, are locked up in these gas hydrates, and that's equivalent to about twice as much carbon as we have in coal, oil, and natural gas combined. So they have great potential. The problem is that they rapidly decompose at surface temperature. So we can get to them and we can bring them up, but when we do, they rapidly decompose and we lose that resource. Some of the other resources from the C4 include sand and gravel, the evaporative salts, and those manganese nodules that you learned about in the last Smart Figure video. Um, the offshore sand and gravel industry is second in economic value to the petroleum industry. Um, the sand and gravel are mined by offshore barges that use suction dredges. And so we use that sand and gravel for concrete um, when we work on roads and also to um, provide sand for uh, beaches. We can also find um, other deposits associated with the sand and gravel like diamonds or tin, platinum, gold, titanium. Um, the evaporative salts like halite, um, when ocean water evaporates, it um, the salts there increase in concentration until they can no longer remain dissolved. So they settle out. Um, and of course we use halite, table salt, um, and um, also keeping it in its rock form as rock salt for um, you know melting ice on the roadway in the wintertime. And then manganese nodules contain manganese and iron, but they also contain uh, copper, nickel, and cobalt, which have a variety of uses for us. Um, and so mining the ocean floor for these manganese nodules is possible. We can do it, but right now it's kind of cost prohibitive. It's not economically profitable to do that yet. So as you've learned in this chapter, um, the ocean floor provides us with a wealth of information about climate, about temperature, about the organisms that once lived there, and then they provide us with some of the resources that we need, oil and gas, sand, gravel, and salt.